And we are live, Jen Michelle. Welcome everyone to the COVID-19 communityresources.com town hall meeting powered by the Center for Closing the Health Gap. Our topic tonight is we must save our kids. So we have a panel of medical experts to answer your questions and address your concerns about the COVID vaccinations for children. Your moderators today will be Superstar Tropicana from The Wiz, who's going to join us a little bit later. And I'm council member Jan Michelle Lemon Kearney. Of course, you know, we have to thank our tech team for making this happen, John Reichel and Lauren Harden. And I want to remind you that we are taking this session so that we can repost it for those who can't be here at the moment. So if you're on Zoom or Facebook, feel free to go right ahead and start entering your questions about the vaccine, the COVID vaccine for children. Uh, let me introduce our stellar panel. Uh, we have Dr. Lou Edgy, Associate Dean, Graduate of Medical Education and Professor of Medical Education, Family and Community Medicine with the University of Cincinnati Medical Center. We have Dr. Carl J. Fichtenbaum, and I think he's joining us a little later as well. And he's the Moderna Principal Investigator and the Infectious Diseases Physician and Professor, Division of Infectious Diseases at UC Health. We have with us right here and ready, Dr. Robert Frank Jr., Pfizer Principal Investigator and Director of the Vaccine Research Center for Cincinnati Children's Hospital. We have Dr. Camille C. Graham, primary care pediatrics physician with Mercy Health. And we have Dr. Roosevelt W. Walker, obstetric, obstetric oh, that's a hard one, and gynecology physician with TriHealth and immediate past president of the Cincinnati Medical Association. Uh, before we get into the questions, I would like to ask each panelist to just make brief intro remarks. Let's start with Dr. Lou Edgy. Thank you so much for hosting this and for giving us the opportunity to help answer some questions. Um, I have um, come to this pandemic from three different perspectives. I've lost family members, which catapulted me into um, the Moderna trial. So I'm a participant and um, got my first vaccine back in, in September of, of last year. And of course, being a family physician, I do take care of all age groups and um, excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you so much for being here. Um, I don't think Dr. Fichtenbaum is on yet, so let me go to Dr. Robert. Yeah, I, I, I am. Oh, are you here, Dr. Fichtenbaum? Wonderful, okay. <laughs> so Dr. Carl J. Fichtenbaum, thank you so much. Yeah, thanks for having me on. Um, I am here because um, I really wanna help the health and welfare of Cincinnati and all of our members of the community. It's very important to me and um, I've been working hard as many other people on the panel have been working and trying to make sure that we have all the right information for our community members and that we do our best to uh, provide health care and uh, good stuff to help all families be healthy. So delighted to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much for being here. Okay, uh, let's see, Dr. Roosevelt Walker. Yeah. And you have to unmute. How about that? <laughs> yeah, there so, go. Good evening, everyone. And thank you, Jan Michelle, uh, for hosting this very important program. And um, the Cincinnati Medical Association uh, has one of its most important uh, jobs is to be an advocate for underrepresented minority patients in our community. And we have been working with uh, this organization since the beginning of, of holding the virtual town hall meetings. And we are, we are working to educate 
our patients so that they understand how important it is to be vaccinated and to vaccinate their children. So we wanna do everything that we can to promote that. All right, thank you so much. Okay, uh, Dr. Robert W. Frank, Jr. Thank you, uh, Jen Michelle. Is it the, so um, we've been working with the vaccines for about a year and a half for adults. And I think it's, it's tremendous that we have vaccines for the adults, but that what I'm really excited about is that now we have the ability to expand that age range. And as of last week, actually even down to five years of age. So um, hopefully be able to answer your questions about that and that you'll be then ready to be able to go get your kids vaccinated. All right, thank you so much. And, and we do have lots of questions already. Okay, Dr. Camille Graham. And Dr. Graham, you are muted. So I'm Dr. Graham, I'm a primary care pediatrician. I've also, I'm also a past president of the Cincinnati Medical Association. I always tell uh, residents and medical students that the P in pediatrics stands for prevention. And one of those eyes stands for immunization. So this is getting to the core of what we do. Um, we'd like to make COVID vaccine part of just the routine immunizations that all kids get, along with flu vaccinations and all the other important immunizations to keep them healthy. I think kids have been um, unnecessarily affected by this epidemic, but have not gotten the attention that the adult uh, population has received. And uh, so part of my reason for being here is to help answer any questions and concerns patients have about vaccination and to really address the other needs of kids, such as their mental health. All right, thank you so much. So, so okay, just starting out, you know, when I, when I was talking to people and telling them we're going to have this, um, this town hall about children and vaccinations, the first thing someone said to me was, you know, why do kids need to be vaccinated? They're in school together. They're, they're running around all day together. They're not getting sick. Do we really need to, to make sure that kids get vaccinated? So the first question is, are children doing okay? Are they getting sick? How are we doing there? And anyone can answer. For, and, you know, doctors, if you'd like to stay unmuted, if that's easier than that way, you can just jump in. I, if you've got a noisy background, then of course you can't do that, but. So Jan Michelle, I would say that if you look at any individual child, their risk for getting severe COVID is small, but it's not zero. And that um, we've now had over 550 children in the United States that have died from COVID. And we've had over 22,000 children hospitalized with COVID. Um, and if you look at it compared to other diseases that are very important that we vaccinate against, is that like flu, like measles, like polio, um, and uh, rotavirus, and many of these other different vaccines, um, which are all very important, none of them have come close to the number of children that have died from COVID. We think all these other, and we know all these other vaccines are very important. So if they're very important, it's really hard to not say that the COVID would even be more important because of the magnitude of uh, illness that the children have suffered. Right. And, you know, I was going to say one thing we talked about at our town hall back in September at that point, um, we understood that more than 25% of the COVID cases across the country were young people less than 18 years old. Um, that's, a, yeah, I mean, yeah. That, that's a lot. One of the things I, I wanna point out, uh, Dr. Um, Camille Graham had mentioned prevention. Um, absolutely, so when you, there's a model that the FDA has, mm -hmm. so if you've vaccinated a million children, that means that you have prevented 58,000 um, cases of COVID. 241 hospitalizations and 77 ICU admissions. And so it's the things that we don't see that that are important as well. And then practically just as a parent, um, you know, if you've got a kid who's been vaccinated and they get exposed to COVID, you don't have to take unscheduled days off work because they were in quarantine. Right, yeah, that, that, yeah really good point there. Yeah. The other thing I, I would emphasize is that the, the, the kids who do get COVID, everyone thinks they just bounce back and they, um, do okay, as, as Bob said, some of them don't do okay. Even if they don't um, die or go to the ICU, a lot of them have had pretty severe symptoms as well, mm -hmm. meaning that they are not only out of school, but sometimes they're out of school for three, four weeks. And then they can also have the multi-symptom inflammatory syndrome, which can happen weeks after they have COVID, um, wow. which can inflammation of the heart muscle, um, the lungs, the brain even. 
I've had a lot of kids who have that brain fog after COVID, so they're not thinking normally. Um, their appetite is low. And the mental health aspect, which I hope you touch on later, <laughs> just this COVID epidemic um, and how it has affected the kids. You know, Dr. Graham, we'll definitely get back to the mental health aspect. That's so important. It's something we often mm -hmm. don't talk about. But let me say Tropicana is here with us. So Tropicana, hi, thank, thanks for joining. Tropicana is my co-host. So let me turn some questions over to her. Tropicana, go right ahead. It's, it's ironic that we are having this conversation because I am home in quarantine with Braylon, who is currently uh, diagnosed with COVID himself. So a lot of the things that you guys are sharing has are big concerns to a lot of people because COVID is really definitely touching a lot of the kids in our neighborhood and around the city. It's definitely a thing. Um, I do want to ask, are children more likely to have less severe cases of COVID and recover from COVID? Yes. Um, it's more likely. So if you look at all the deaths in the country, is that there's been around, unfortunately now, almost 700,000 or over 700,000 deaths across the country, across the whole age group. Um, and only 550 of those have been in children, but um, those children have been pretty much healthy, normal children beforehand. And one of the other things too, is like, you know, to follow up is, do we really need to vaccinate all children? Is that if you look at the kids that have died from COVID, um, 30 to 40% had absolutely no risk factor, nothing to say that they were sick at all, that had any underlying problem. And so if we even just tried to target kids that would be at, excuse me, be at high risk, we'd be missing a significant portion of the children that would um, be at risk for um, getting severe disease and dying from this virus. Wow. One thing that I noticed this week in our COVID experience is that he never lost his taste or smell, but yeah. was still diagnosed yeah. with COVID. And we're seeing that a lot with kids. Is this just a different mm -hmm. form of how COVID is mutating? So, how so should the, parents be aware? Yeah, The Delta variant is a little bit different than the original strain that circulated. And so each variant differs in terms of its symptoms. And the loss of taste and smell is far less common with the Delta variant, which represents about 95 to 98% of all infections that are occurring in the United States right now. You know, one of the other things about human beings that's very interesting is how we measure our own risk or that of our children. And I think most of us go about this decision-making process saying, well, I'm healthy, my kids are healthy, we'll be fine. But then again, we always see on the news, oh, there was a car accident and somebody got, you know, like, okay, but that wasn't me. And that's the philosophy that many people go about life thinking is, it won't be me, it won't be me. But unfortunately, nobody has a crystal ball and we don't know who the me will be. And if you really look at vaccination right now, there are many diseases for which we're vaccinating children and parents gladly do this. Measles, mumps, rubella, polio. If you ask Dr. Frank, those are very common right now because we vaccinated people and we got rid of them. And so people don't see them anymore, but they gladly take their children and say, oh yeah, let's get our preventative vaccinations. That's what you have to think about this COVID vaccine. It's a preventative vaccination for your child and for our community and all of our families. So, okay, Dr. Fichtenbaum, I'm just gonna be devil's advocate here um, because you know, I, let me just say, I believe in, in, in the COVID vaccination. My children are both vaccinated. Um, but so people will say the, va the COVID vaccination, unlike smallpox and measles and all that, this COVID vaccination is new. How do we know it's safe for our kids? Well, and that's a great comment because we don't have five, 10 years of experience. But here's the most interesting thing about vaccination. If you look very carefully at hundreds of thousands of millions of doses of vaccination studied by the FDA. Most of the side effects for vaccines became evident within 57 days. That's an average. 
And it's really important to understand that this concept of long-term side effects from vaccinations is not a scientific concept based on scientific evidence. It's a worry and a concern, sometimes fueled by misinformation. The reality is when you have a side effect from a vaccine, it's something that happens right away. If you actually look at our vaccines, Pfizer or Moderna, the RNA is removed from the body within a couple of weeks and no longer present. And the proteins that are produced are taken care of by our immune system and they don't last very long either. So the whole concept of five to 10 years from now, I'm, you know, my left arm will fall off or something bad will happen. I might go bald, whatever it is, is really not a scientifically based concept. It's a worry and concern. And I share those worries and concerns, but I think we have to be reassured that we've been doing all of our due diligence in these studies and we have a lot of information about both adults and children. If, so Jan, Michelle, if I could just follow up on that uh, just a second to, from what Dr. Fichtenbaum was saying, because I've been asked that question a number of times too, and I've been trying to think it through. And I think, you know, one of the things different as far as if the other physicians on the panel think about it is, you know, if we're prescribing a medicine, say like for diabetes or for heart disease or for cholesterol or something like that, they're getting that medicine every day for years, right? And so there's a possibility there that you could have something that shows up months or years down the line just because of the accumulation of the medicine in your body. But like Dr. Fichtenbaum was saying, with a vaccine, you're getting something two, maybe three times, and that's it for your life. And, and it's, it's gone after the, the vaccine part is gone after a few days, like Dr. Fichtenbaum was saying. So that's where the, I think, a little bit different between medication and mm -hmm. vaccines. And then the other thing on top of that, too, is that um, we've now had literally hundreds of millions of adults receive full vaccination. And the only things that we have seen that have shown up in the um, millions of people getting vaccine that we didn't see in the clinical trials is one is that with the platelets with uh, clotting issues with the uh, uh, J and J vaccine, but in the incidence of one in 500,000. And honestly, that's the same risk of getting hit by lightning in Ohio because I looked it up. Oh, wow. It's the same risk as getting hit by lightning. So if you kind of put it in that context. Right? Yeah. 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 And, and the other is with the myocarditis and myocarditis really sounds scary because you're talking about the heart and the muscle and that, but they've actually been uh, pretty mild cases where um, most of the children have been, or young adults been able to be treated at home with um, Motrin basically, and that, uh, and not have long-term side effects. And if you look at you know, people say, well, even still, okay, I don't want to get that because of the myocarditis. COVID of getting the disease, there's a seven times increased risk of getting myocarditis from COVID as compared to the vaccine. So that, wow. um, you know, that, uh, so COVID itself, as um, Dr. Graham was mentioning, can have a lot of long-term effects. Vaccines, we don't think have a lot of long-term mm -hmm. effects, but the viruses, we certainly know that does. And so, so, and I was going to ask you about myocarditis. So that's inflammation of the of heart. The heart. Okay. Um, which does sound pretty scary, but you're saying that, that those who have gotten it from the COVID, most of them are actually treated at home and recovering and doing fine. Yes. It's rare. Okay. I, I, and I think, it, I think it's really important. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Dr. Graham. No, no, the ones who've gotten it from the vaccine are doing well. Right. Some who've gotten it from the natural disease are not doing so well. Okay. The yeah, yeah. So I think we should be really careful about this. So, you know, everything about this pandemic is on Twitter, on social media, on everything. If I, if I blink and, and say something strange, it's all over and it's gone viral. And so this is the most, in my professional lifetime, scrutinized disease under a microscope that anything happens. I mean, people didn't care about the research I was doing before COVID. They just didn't care <laughs> at all. Okay. And now 
they care whether I go to the restroom or not or something like that. It's yeah. crazy. So the thing yeah. about it is that when you have somebody like a, a kid or somebody come in and say, oh, you know, my, my chest, is, I just feel a little uncomfortable. I'm a little short of breath. People are now getting MRIs and looking for, do they have myocarditis? Let's do an EKG. Let's check this out. Whereas, you know, we've been giving vaccinations for decades and people have probably experienced this and we haven't been looking for it as closely. It's probably a property that is related to vaccination and an immune response where there may be some cross reaction that occurs with specific proteins. It's very mild in most cases. And when you, when you really weigh it out, comparing what happens with the vaccine versus what happens with the disease, hands down, you don't want COVID. Okay, yeah. right, all right. I do One thing I would emphasize, a lot of young people, um, parents and teenagers say, I don't wanna get the vaccine because I have a football game tomorrow or I have to carry a heavy tuba and marching band. I think there's a lot of fear out there that everybody who gets the vaccine is gonna have this sore arm, muscle aches and fever. And that really is unusual. I mean, it can happen, but I, what I don't want young people to do is to delay getting it because they're afraid of, you know, they have um, an important event coming up on the weekend. So I'm not gonna get it on Thursday. Um, get it as soon as possible. Cause I've been hearing this now since April. There's always wow. another reason to delay, to delay, to delay. Or what I hear is I'm gonna wait. Well, wait, how long? How long do you plan to wait? And people can't give me an answer. Um, so I kind of like to hear from the audience, like, what are you waiting for? What, right. what, what are you waiting for? The, the vaccine has been out for the kids, um, the teenagers since I think April. Now it's out for the kids five to 11. What are you waiting for? Yeah, good question. Uh, Dr. Tropicana, you Dr. Were, you Edgy, were yeah, I did. Thank you, Majin Michelle. Dr. Edgy, do is, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, guys, speaking over each other. Um, what about kids with underlying symptoms? So, um, kids who have sickle cell disease, who have obesity, who have diabetes, um, it's all the same things that put uh, adults at higher risk, immunocompromised status. Um, all of those things are things that would put a, a child at higher risk. Um, to get it. I'm sorry about your son and I hope he gets better soon. He's talking his head off. So I think he's I, heading in the right direction. He's playing football. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Last time he was, he was at a uh, football practice back in September. So. Yeah, he was. Thank you yeah. guys. Football season is over. So oh. in regards to getting the, <laughs> getting the vaccine, we should not wait when our kids have any underlying symptom. We should no. Pursue Those quicker. things put them at risk, but it also puts them at risk for getting, um, if they do get COVID, for getting sicker. So um, definitely going ahead and, and getting getting vaccinated. If there's any questions, certainly contact your pediatrician or your family physician mm -hmm. if, on a personal issue. Yeah. But um, absolutely, in general, that you know those conditions are, are ones where you do want to go ahead and get vaccinated. Can I can I clarify yeah, that question though? Can I ask for clarification on that? When you say underlying symptoms, do you mean that for they're- For kids who have any other kind of ailments, if they're just not your normal, average, everyday healthy kid, a kid who may be struggling with any other type of illness or you know, yeah. congenital heart disease or sickle cell or anemia or any of those other uh, issues that they may have medically, should they have he any hesitation towards getting a vaccine or no. like she said, see your doctor? Be first in line to get the vaccine. Those are the people we called first and said, we we have it or it's now available. Please, please go get it or come to our office and get it. They, they're moved to the top of the line. And some of them even qualify for a booster shot. Okay. Just wondering, and I know there are some parents who have kids that are struggling with other things that they would say, okay, I'm a little nervous about getting the vaccine. How will this affect their treatments or the things that they're already dealing with? So I just wanted to make sure I asked that for those parents as well. Let me just uh, ask Dr. Fichtenbaum, because I think, I think you might've thought, which was a, a thought that I was having, 
um, that maybe Tropicana was talking about people, uh, kids who have symptoms of COVID. So for example, Tropicana's son now can't be vaccinated mm -hmm. for, a, 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 at least not immediately, can he? I mean, I know with adults, you had to wait so many months after having COVID before getting vaccinated. Isn't that right? No. Yeah, that's an interesting story. Um, but the the like you know, <laughs> the thing is the thing is is that uh, you know kids sometimes have sniffles, kids have coughs. There's actually been decades of research that show that the immune response that they get to a vaccine is fine. It's just as good. And most of us recommend get the vaccine when you're there. Get your vaccine for whatever you need. The COVID issue was an interesting one. And, and let me give you just a little short little history on this. We didn't have enough vaccine. And if you remember back, we had this very convoluted system whereby the left-handed, one brown eye, one blue eye, uh, 67 and a half year old whose birthday comes up next week is gonna be first in line for a COVID vaccine. And then you had to wait till your number was called. So when it came to who we were going to vaccinate, the guidelines committee said, well, if people have recently had COVID, they probably have immunologic protection from getting reinfected in the next 90 days. So we're going to come out with a regulation that says, well, don't vaccinate them in 90 days. And that's the reason why, based on scarcity, the reality is if you're feeling well and you're out of isolation, don't go anywhere where you're going to get somebody sick. But if you're out of isolation, you don't have a fever, your symptoms are better, those people can be vaccinated at any point in time. And personally, I usually tell people, about 30 days because you feel better and you're over it. You just come in, get your vaccine because I don't know what variant is coming and I don't know how predictable your immune response was to your particular infection, but it's very predictable to the vaccine. We have a lot of good information about people having a really good immune response. So, I, I tell people, go ahead. Uh, and I don't know if Dr. Frank has a different view. Oh, the only thing I would say is that uh, the, good, the reason I like being a pediatrician because they get better faster than the adults. And so that by a month, they've already forgotten they had COVID. So uh, we, we, I would even <laughs> say that probably even a week or something like that. But basically the, the premise that you were using, as soon as they're feeling well enough and that they're not contagious to somebody else. And, that, and along those ground, uh, lines too is that uh, I had a lot of questions. People said, well, they've already had COVID. Why should I get a vaccine? And what we've actually seen is that um, in small studies where they've compared people that everybody had COVID and then some people decided to get vaccine and some people decided, I don't care. I've had COVID. I'm just going to wait it out. This group that didn't get vaccinated had a three times increased risk of getting COVID again compared to the group that did get vaccinated. So vaccine can actually increase your immunity above um, the, the disease itself. All right, good point. So don't just don't just assume because your kid has COVID, they don't need to get vaccinated. Correct. Just get vaccinated. Yeah. Um, can you tell? Okay, Doctor Doctor Fichtenbaum and Doctor Frank and Doctor Edgy, don't don't feel left out of this. We're gonna we're gonna ask Not you about this. Out. So yeah, and and also Doctor Graham, but I just wanted to know about the status of FDA approval for uh, Moderna and Pfizer. I think it's Pfizer that's being given now, isn't that right? Or you know, just yes. tell us about that. So um, the Pfizer vaccine is now approved for um, five and above that they um, first got approval for the 18 and above as did Moderna, then 16 to 17 for Pfizer and then 12 to 15 for Pfizer and then this five to 11 that Moderna has submitted their data to the FDA, they have it. Um, for the 12 and above and that they're reviewing it. I really can't um, tell you anything more than that because I just don't know. I mean, other than I know that they have the data and they're reviewing it. Um, my assumption is that the FDA is doing their job like they should and that they're reviewing the data carefully and that they will make a decision when they feel like they have sufficient information about that. I mean, I think they're looking at a little bit about um, 
the myocarditis. But as Dr. Fichtebaum was saying, is that the um, vaccine is still far safer than the uh, disease. But so for right now, though, it's just the um, Pfizer vaccine that's available for anybody under 18. Okay, all right. And then we have a question from uh, Facebook. And so are the ingredients in the vaccine for children the same as the vaccine for adults? Yes, yeah, so the um, five to 11 is a third of the dose of the adult dose um, okay. for Pfizer, so. Mm -hmm. So basically they just took the same vaccine and just made it a smaller Three dose. Three doses, yeah. Yeah, well, the, I, I think that Pfizer actually used a couple of different, slightly different stabilizing agents to make it a little bit more friendly for uh, refrigeration and dissemination. But when you talk about ingredients, um, what's common about both Pfizer and Moderna is they use fats because um, it helps to stabilize things. And then there is this special mRNA and there's really not a lot of other strange things at all. I know that people are looking in there and they're somehow thinking that there's something weird in there, but this is not the recipe that you're family makes back with the some sort of Cajun cooking or something. This is, you know, pretty straightforward vanilla stuff that we put in here. Uh, and so, it's not, it's very benign, really, very, I, very mild. I think, you know, to follow up again with Dr. Fichtenbaum was saying, as far as what he was saying, you know, with the mRNA that you had to put a fat layer around it. The reason we had to do that is that when we tried using mRNA by itself, our cellular enzymes, our chemicals we have on our body actually broke the mRNA down before it could ever get into our cell. So that the fat is actually what allows it to get into the cells. That's why it has such a good immune response on me. Uh, that, uh, but, the, uh, um, but, the, uh, um, but actually that just shows you how labile, how easily that mRNA is broken down is that when they use the original formulation, which actually you had asked about being new, mRNA vaccine has been around for about 20 years. And people have been using them for um, vaccines against cancer is the way that they started being used and that they've actually shown a lot of promise with those. Um, but when you use just the mRNA by itself, it never it gets into our cells. It gets, it gets chewed up before it even get in. Okay, great, great to know. And, and you know, Dr. Edgy has been educating us on this for quite some time. So I just threw that new one thing being devil's advocate. I know this, this is like, not, it's not new at all. And as, as Dr. Edgy says, this is just like putting a cherry on top of the cake that's already made. Cake's been made, it's been sitting there. And now we're just putting the cherry on top. Um, so, you know, so, so for Pfizer and Moderna, do children still need two doses of that? Okay, they still need two doses. And then is Johnson and Johnson coming up with 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 the vaccine for children as well? The, the oh, one that's that that's really interesting. So yeah, they are they're looking at the same thing, um, and they were originally they were using one vaccine, but they're uh, really carefully looking at all of their data, and now with the discussion of what people have called boosters, I think most people are recommending a second. Uh, vaccination of Johnson and Johnson, and they're looking very carefully at the at the lower age groups, and the way that this uh, whole thing has kind of come out, Pfizer was sort of the lead stallion, and Moderna was kind of uh, close behind a month and a half or so, and Johnson and Johnson just a touch further back. So I think we can expect more data and information coming out as well. Okay. And, and with respect to the boosters for J and J, um, you know, there's data supporting mixing and matching. So mm -hmm. if you've got J and J to, you know, um, following up with either Moderna or the Pfizer, yeah. still and, good protection. And so that's okay. that's for adults. What you're talking about, then, Dr. Edgy. But that, um, yeah, that was a study that we just we had worked with the NIH on, and it actually shows that it doesn't matter um, which primary vaccine you got that you can. At boost with any one of them. And so as Dr. Fichtenbaum was saying, is that the, the people who had the highest boost were the people that had a dose of Johnson & Johnson, but that's because they started a little bit lower level. But the great news is that when you look at the end, so that regardless of what somebody got at the first vaccines, after they got their booster, they all were over off the screen. My, my hands are off the screen. Um, right. they're, they're way above um, where they were even after that second dose. So they boost tremendously well, regardless of what um, uh, product you got. 
Okay, great. So we've got a lot of questions in the Q&A, but I'm going to hold them just for a second, if that's okay. Um, you know, Tropicana was talking about her son being, you know, talkative and sounds like he's feeling great. But Dr. Graham, which we're really, really happy for it, but Dr. Graham brought up the whole mental health issue. Yes. And so Dr. Graham, I didn't want us to run out of time before we mm -hmm. talked about that. Can you address that issue? Let's, let's talk about the whole mental health issue um, surrounding COVID. So I think surrounding COVID as a disease, um, I think this is um, probably probably more devastating than polio in terms of mental health for kids. Um, so you have the community effects of you know being in lockdown and being homeschooled um, for a whole year, not developing social skills, and then of course the younger the kids are, the less um, the less chance they had of really developing those social skills, which is so critical in the first years of life. Um, the other devastating effect of mental health is um, just isolation in general. You're not able to sit at the lunch table with, you know, 10 of your friends. Um, you're not able to go to parties. So the normal stuff that kids and teens would do, even sports got delayed for quite a while. So, um, so a lot of kids literally um, were in the house. And we would encourage parents, well, you, you know, they have to go outside, but some parents were so terrified, they didn't even want their kids to go outside. So they weren't even going to the park. They weren't riding their bikes. Um, so that was another thing. It's just the whole fresh air and getting outside. Um, and then the, uh, the other devastating and, and really tragic thing about COVID is something like over 300,000 kids have lost a family member um, to COVID or a caretaker who might have been a, a grandmother or a babysitter. Um, we don't know yet what that long-term effect will be, but I can tell you lots of kids have lost um, really significant um, caregivers and family members who will not be there at Thanksgiving this year. They won't be there at Christmas. So I think, there, to me, I see there are three reasons really to, for kids to get vaccinated. One is to protect them, even though um, the chances of having severe COVID are, is rare. But who wants to miss school for, you know, another 10 days or longer when they don't, you know, if you have the vaccine, they will protect you. The other is to protect your family because you you have somebody older or high risk in your family, and um, so everyone wants to get together. But then, you know, you have some people are more susceptible than others of getting very sick. And then to protect your community, and we know in the African American community that you know COVID has been much more devastating than in the white community. There are more. White people have died from COVID because they're more white people. But if you look at relative risk, the, the African-American and actually people of color have really been devastated by this disease. Something like 73, almost 75,000 black people are no longer here because of COVID. So I think that, you know, I, I see where there are three good reasons to vaccinate your child. The other thing I think as well mm -hmm. regarding mental health is, you know, the 26% increase in um, suicide attempts, um, mm -hmm. you know, with children coming to the, you know, to the emergency room mm -hmm. as compared to 2019 to 2020. So um, that's, that has um, got long-term sequelae if, mm -hmm. if it's an attempt even uh, not completed. Right. And is that, yeah, is, is that rise in suicide um, because of the uh, isolation or the fear? Is there any understanding about you know what's going on there multiple factors including yeah. the loss of family members displaced yeah. um access to uh, public um dollars because that family member has gone there's so many different things yeah and, and I, oh, I i think it's also important to recognize that some of the effects may be even longer lasting because mm -hmm. communities where resources are not really good didn't have the same access to online schooling and people being left behind, which is a common thing in our society, got even further behind. And that's, that's just wrong, not fair. Doesn't matter how many hotspots we come up with, you know, we just don't have an equal playing field. And so it's really important to get all of our children uh, the best education we possibly can and many learners do better in a, in a classroom, in a visual setting, because young people really learn by multiple different methods. Yeah. I mean, yeah, one of the things, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Camille. No. 
No, I, I wanted to emphasize again, the incidence of anxiety and depression in teens has really increased. Um, so we know when anxiety and depression increase, and I don't think it's because we're diagnosing it better. I think there was a real increase when that happens, mm -hmm. then we expect more suicide. So I just want to say that. Yeah. I mean, what I was gonna just mention was that you know, last week we had a, a vaccine clinic over at Cincinnati Children's for the kids five to 11. And I went over there, I was overwhelmed the number of kids that were there. But the thing that was amazing is that I said, oh my God, the kids are playing, they're coloring, they're mm -hmm. having fun with each other. And I said, I forgot. Yeah. This is, I mean, this is normal kids. And, and mm -hmm. I had forgotten, you know, because this has been so foreign for the last two years. And I said, mm -hmm this is why we need the vaccine. Look at the kids, yeah. look at how they're interacting, look at how they're having fun, look at how they're being normal. And that, and it's really, I mean, it's crazy to say that in a two year period, you could forget that. But then as soon as I saw it, it was like, wow. I mean, mm -hmm. it's so clear as far as how life has been disrupted and, and how, but again, that's what I love about kids as far as that, how quickly they were making friends and that they were interacting with each other and that, and that, uh, and wanting to get back to normal. Right. Okay, so so let me, um, Tropicana, why don't you give us some questions from the chat, from the Q&A? Absolutely. We just got a question that said, my parent has COVID and is well enough to not be accepted to the hospital and I am vaccinated. Should I get my booster right now when I'm exposed to it or should I wait? Uh, I think if you're ready for your booster and it's time for you to get it, go get your booster. It doesn't matter whether you're exposed or not. Um, if that's the period, go ahead and do it. And I certainly hope that your family member is okay and does well. Absolutely. I, I have a question for Dr. Graham. Dr. Graham, you mentioned mm -hmm. that brain fog is one of the symptoms that people deal with after having COVID. For our parents, we all know that we our goal here is to encourage people to get vaccinated. Well, for kids who have dealt with, with parents who have kids who have dealt with COVID, there are obviously tons of us because the pediatricians are jam booked. How do we deal with those symptoms of COVID or the afterlife of COVID, like the brain fog? How do you encourage your kids in those moments? What do you suggest? So I don't have a magic answer because there is no magic medicine that makes it um, go away. The, um, and it's very variable. So it, some kids recover within a week or two and some it goes on for a few weeks. I, I treat it kind of like I would do a concussion and, and talk about rest, getting sleep, um, not skipping meals, keeping the video games to a minimum um, because we know that um, you know, the stimulation you get from um, blue light and you know, just video in general probably doesn't help your brain to rest. Um, I don't know, Bob or um, Dr. Fickenbaugh, if you've seen this, it seems like the kids who had more of the smell and taste had more of the neurological symptoms. I don't know if there's any um, correlation, but I, I treat those that brain fog kind of the same way and not to push them, you know, if they need an excuse from school to only go half days for a while, or they need some accommodations um, longer, time um, to do projects, or maybe this isn't a good time to do your standardized tests, then we write letters for them like that. I kind of treat it like I would a concussion though, I mean, without any evidence, that. <laughs> but I just, it just seems like it would make sense. We have seen a lot of kids that have mm -hmm. in clinic that have come in for just prolonged fatigue and uh, mm -hmm. fevers. Um, and so unfortunately we don't have a drug or anything that's gonna make that go away. It's gonna be time, but um, it's been a pretty common uh, reason kids have been coming into the clinic over the last year and a half. Okay, here's, a, here's another question. Um, it says, uh, we've received as a reason, I guess we're not getting vaccinations. Uh, parents are hesitant to get the vaccine um, a few parents shared that they weren't going to let their children get the vaccine because they believe that their child has a weaker immune system than adults. Is that something one of you or several of you could address, please? Well, I think that children always uh, surprise you in many different ways. They are not little adults, they are children and their immune systems are learning. And it's not that their immune systems are weaker, it's that they're less experienced. And as they grow, their immune systems grow too. 
So there's not really a danger for children as a result of that. There's actually a really important thing, which is, is that it's far better to get your experience and all your learning done when you're younger and healthier than when you're some old guy like me and you don't want to get sick then because then you're in big trouble. You're not an yeah. old guy. <laughs> but, yeah. But yeah, I would. Yeah, if this is. Uh, go so ahead, Camille. No, I, no, I was going to say is that I would turn it the other way around. I would say the kids' immune systems are uh, in some ways better. I mean, if you look at a flu shot, we give the same dose of flu shot to a six-month-old as we give to a 64-year-old. It's when we get to 65 yeah. is when we have to, in, yes, it's when we get to 65 yeah. is when we have to give the bigger dose because our immune systems are getting, um, as we call it, uh, mature. Um, that uh, I, 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 So Dr. Fichtenbaum obviously is much different than me as far as old, um, but that uh, um, so that actually the kids respond very well. And to me, what I would say too, is that if you looked at it, we were talking a little bit earlier, is the children's dose, the five to 11 year old is only one third the amount that the adults need. And that's, and they had the same exact immune response, their antibody levels is the exact same as the adults when they got 10 micrograms versus the adults getting 30. So I would say that the kid's immune system works really well and yeah. that, uh, um, and it's, uh, so, but I would not be worried at all about uh, a child not being able to respond to the vaccine. That's good I, I, uh, Yeah. I'm sorry, am I, am I cutting you no. off? Dr. No, I just said I would agree with that. I think that, um, Kids, the other thing is kids' immune systems are constantly bombarded by many viruses all day long. You go to a daycare center and, you know, the kids will get a cold, sniffles, and they recover from it. So I always tell parents if they're worried about a vaccine, I mean, your child, by the time the child gets the, their second or third vaccine, they've already been exposed to millions of different viruses, most of which don't even make them run a fever, make them sick. It's just because their immune system is so good at fighting it off. And if I could put in a plug for breastfeeding, there are studies that show that mothers who either get the vaccine or had COVID when they were pregnant, those antibodies go into the breast milk and are, are actually immunizing. Oh. So it's another reason for pregnant women to get the vaccine. Yeah, that's good to know because I'm thinking maybe some pregnant women might be afraid to breastfeed after having COVID, but you're saying it really helps your child. It helps, yes. They have active you know, one, of, one of the most interesting things in the history of medicine were before we had really good vaccination, and this is true in my family, my mother sent my sister over to the neighbor's house who had rubella or German measles because they didn't want them to get it when they were older and pregnant because that was one of the things that was passed during pregnancy and caused damage because we knew that it, kids respond very well and they just do fine. But when you get to be an adult, there can be more problems with all of these infections. I think that's our protective nature of our children. We tend to protect them, but their immune systems are gangbusters, good stuff. All right, so here's another question. Um, this sounds really promising. Uh, this person said they've heard that there is or soon will be a pill form of the COVID vaccine. Is that true? And if so, when will it be available for children? And I would add, or for adults, is there a pill that's coming? Because some people are just afraid of, you know, this, the shot does not hurt. We keep telling people it doesn't hurt, but some people are just really afraid of, of getting the injection. So is there a pill coming out? You know, we've tried lots of different kinds of vaccines over the years, and um, we haven't gotten very good at pill form vaccines, period, for any kind of disease. Our intestinal system seems to break stuff down pretty well. There are pills coming out to treat COVID, uh, and maybe people are getting that a little bit confused. Uh, you know, I, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'd much rather prevent something than have to take a pill for something. So uh, I think we still have to go with the shots and I'll be happy to hold your hand and give you a smiley face Band-Aid after you get it. <laughs> well, you know, I, I've watched people really afraid of getting them. And, you know, the, the folks who are administering these vaccinations from the Cincinnati Health Department are just so fantastic and so patient. And after it's over, 
the person always says that didn't even hurt, but you know, but getting up to that point is just, right. you know, it, it's really a challenge. Mm -hmm. Trump, I'm sorry, you're about to say something. No, I was just laughing about the band aid and the holding your hand. I wasn't <laughs> saying anything. But there, so there is a, there are a couple um, uh, vaccines that are being tested that are nasal sprays. Um, but those are in early phases, so they're not uh, available yet, um, but those are um, being looked at, uh, just like the flu mist vaccine we have for a flu vaccine where you can get the spray up your nose too. Oh, right. Okay, now another question is, do you think that schools will require students who play sports to be vaccinated? They should. They should, okay. They absolutely should. <laughs> well, you know, we've, seen, we've, seen, we've seen a lot of transmission yeah. Uh, of COVID within uh, sports teams. And it happens very, very commonly. There's a lot of close contact. Uh, and so, you know, it really is for the safety of all of us and to try and end this pandemic, we just want to get the immune levels up in our, in all of our communities. All right. Yeah. Are we, uh, are we, Pat, are we far enough along in people getting vaccinated to fully be open and moving forward? Because for some reason, it seems like people just don't seem to think that we're in a pandemic or take it as serious as we did yeah. a year ago. And our kids are out here getting COVID. Should we be kind of very cautious still and doing the same things that we were doing a year or two ago and we just aren't? Did I miss we something? still are having a thousand <laughs> people die of COVID every day. So that by itself for me is, this is still pandemic. Yeah. And I, I think if you look at the community that you're in, so I think Vermont is something like 80% vaccinated, but even, even when you look at the national figures, there's subpopulations. So teens, um, even though the vaccine's been out six months, they're still only about 50 some percent vaccinated. And, and, you know, you go in some communities, it might be higher than that, and some it's lower. But if you know teens, they kind of will cross populations, right? They will travel from one side of town to the other. So I think you really have to know the community that you're in. Um, and um, so I would say it's very variable, but I would say right now we are far from where we would consider um, everyone can just go and do uh, what they want to do. Unfortunately, I think it's become so political that people are not listening to the evidence and they're, you know, they're kind of making stuff up and what, what feels good um, is kind of what carries the day. But we know that that's not a good strategy. And the other thing is a pandemic a global, yeah. It's a global yeah. pandemic. Yeah. And for yeah. the um, countries that are not you know, the um, first world countries, it's only 2.5% of folks who've gotten one vaccine in the yeah. poorer countries across the rest of the world. This is, this is not just a community-based thing. This is, this is global. And so we have a long, long way to go to get everyone else um, vaccinated. Okay, wonderful. You know, I just realized Dr. Walker um, might have dropped off. No, he's just being quiet. He's I think there. He's, he's there. Oh, Dr. <laughs> the Walker, I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, you know, I didn't see you on here and I'm so sorry. So Dr. Walker, let me get you to weigh in. You know, we're, we're getting near the end and you always have so many helpful things to say. So let's start our wrap up with Dr. Walker. Thank you. And as an obstetrician, I would like to speak to our female patients. For, for women who are pregnant, for women who are breastfeeding, for women who are planning to become pregnant, for women who have just become pregnant, it is safe for you to take the vaccination. You need to take the vaccination. The vaccination protects you. And we now have evidence that the vaccination is even protecting the baby that you're carrying. And the other thing that I always like to point out to people is that one of the leaders on the team that developed the vaccination is an African-American scientist female scientist. Her name is Dr. Kismikia Corbett, and she helped develop the vaccination that we are using. So why would a Black woman develop a vaccine that's going to kill Black people? COVID kills us, and we can protect ourselves by taking the vaccination. 
All right. Thank you so much. Okay, so uh, let, let's let's hear some remarks from. Let's just go down the line, uh, Dr. Edgy. If you have additional questions, there's no stupid question. So please um, go ahead and contact uh, one of us. Um, I'm certainly happy to to um, have my number out there. Um, please get vaccinated. It's the only way we're going to get out of this pandemic. Don't have and any you know regrets. What? Thank you. And you know, before uh, and before I, we have closing remarks, someone said, please, please address the fertility questions. Please ask Dr. Walker. So Dr. Walker, if you could address that really fast and then we'll go back and, and, and hear the closing remarks from our other physicians. We have no evidence that the vaccination uh, interferes with fertility. Okay. None. Right. Okay, that's the answer. The vaccination does not interfere with fertility. Okay, so Dr. Fichtenbaum. Yeah, I'm just uh, delighted to be here with this esteemed group. They, these are people I really admire, all of you from many different uh, walks of life, whether you're coming walking through my neighborhood campaigning for political office and we say <laughs> hello. Who would do that? <laughs> and, and, and you don't even recognize me because I'm not wearing a tie and I don't look professional. Right, that's right. That was so funny. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> that but was it's really, it really is an honor and it's my pleasure to be part of these things to help our community understand what works, what doesn't work and to also have a great discussion about it. Uh, at the end of the day, I just want everybody to be safe for as few people as possible to see me ever in a medical capacity, but see me out on the street and make fun of me that way. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. Dr. Frey. So I think one of the things that has been important to me is that it's been kind of alluded to on this as far as that. Um, there are populations that have been at higher risk for this virus and getting sick from others, but, and, and I think we need to protect everybody. And that, uh, and one of the things I've told people is this is an equal opportunity virus. It doesn't care if you're Republican or Democrat. It doesn't care if you're a woman or a man. It doesn't care if you're black, you're Asian, you're white. It doesn't care if you're young or old. It's just looking for somebody to infect. And it's doing a really good job of it. Um, and so that uh, that's why we're all taking our time to be here and, and talking with the community so that people can hear the information. And it's like Dr. Edgy was saying, as far as ask your questions so you can feel comfortable and know that the vaccine is the right thing. And that, you know, statistics have changed a little bit, but as of the end of August, 97% of all the COVID related hospitalizations in the United States and 99% of all the COVID related deaths in the United States are in unvaccinated people. Wow. So this really is a pandemic now becoming more and more of the unvaccinated and that, and that's something that we can change. So definitely we can change that. That's something we can control. And so we ought to do it. Thank you yes. so much. Okay. Dr. Graham. So I would really like to thank you for having um, all of us. And it has been, Wonderful. Uh, I don't think uh, Cincinnati is, realizes how lucky they are to have Dr. Craig and Dr. Fichtenbaum. Um, I've known Bob for several years and I always tell people if they have a question about the vaccine, I say, well, I know the person who did the clinical trials for Pfizer. And, and I think that carries some weight. And if there's any question, I can speed dial him and get answers. And um, he's, he's always been so accessible and so available. Um, and I would just ask everyone there, please don't wait. Please don't wait, just, just do it. And Dr. Graham, I just, you know, I know we're closing out, but I just want to say, because you did bring up mental health. So mm -hmm. would we also advise parents to make sure they check with their young people and mm -hmm. see if there are any behavioral changes or mood changes so that we're, we're aware of, of that depression? Right. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Tropicana, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you all for your wonderful remarks. I've learned a lot. I cannot wait to go back and share this with my peers. But of course, in closing, we have to turn it over to our esteemed Renee Mahaffey Harris, the president of the president CEO of the Closing the Health Gap. Excuse me. I'm still working on it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. 
Well, first of all, Tropicana, thank you for being here. Um, and, and we're our best to Braylon that he gets well soon. Um, I want to thank Dr. Fichtenbaum and Dr. Frank. Um, as everyone else has, for the fact that you are the principal investigators for both Moderna and Pfizer. Um, and we are really grateful for your leadership and the work that you've done that brought us to this place where we do have many people vaccinated, but yet have a way to go. Um, Dr. Walker, Dr. Graham, Dr. Edgy, thank you all for your work, not just here on the town hall, but answering questions that we get on social media or being a part of conversations in senior housing or shots at the shop or um, the students that you've sent our way who've been a part of conversations in some of our local high schools and um, answering the questions. Um, and as Dr. Edgy said, no question is a bad question. And so I think the more we make it easy for people to ask those questions they're uncomfortable with, or that they're getting some information, they're not sure. I think the more that we make it safe to ans to ask a question, mm -hmm. the, the more likely we are to move people from no to yes. Um, I'm really grateful for all of our partners at the COVID-19 Community Resources.com site, the African American Chamber of Commerce, the NAACP, the Urban League of Greater Cincinnati and Southwest Ohio, Cincinnati Medical Association, um, our, both of our health departments, Cincinnati and the Hamilton County Health Departments. Um, and of course, our moderators um, who have been um, tireless in, in their efforts to educate the community. Um, we will get through this time together. Um, I hope that we remember to give each other grace um, this is a difficult time. It's an uncertain time for many of us. It's an uncertain time for all of us, right? But if we can remember to give each other that continued grace um, and remember that we need each other and that we are very much interdependent, um, I believe that we will be better as a community and as a state and as a country as we get through this time and as we make it easy and, and, and very accessible for people to easily get the vaccine. So I wanna thank you all for joining us this evening um, and so grateful for all the work that each of you do every day to save lives. So thank you and we must continue to work together to save us. You we all have a great evening. Our kids. That's right. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Have a thank good you. evening, guys. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, hopefully Braylon will improve. All right. Yes, Braylon. Go Braylon.